Well, good morning, folk. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the Lord's Day, Sunday the 25th of July, and it's our privilege to be able to come together even in a virtual space for the preaching of God's Word this morning. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Gavin Johnston. I'm the, one of the elders and the main preaching pastor here at the Randwood Baptist Church in Johannesburg in South Africa. So if you've just happened to stumble across this video on our YouTube channel, welcome. It's good to have you with us this morning. But just a note again that this is a pre-recorded uh, video of the sermon and the intercessory prayer. We're still submitting ourselves to the level four rest restrictions as imposed by the government to curtail the spread of the uh, third wave in Gauteng. Uh, so uh, this has been pre-recorded and uh, we trust that the president uh, this evening when he hopefully addresses the nation will give us some relief and uh, give us the opportunity to at least start meeting together. We're busy with a series called, in or at least entitled, God Has Called. We spent two weeks having a look at God's call to salvation. Then uh, two weeks ago, we had a look at the call of God to separation through the lens of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Last week, just in light of the national events that had happened with the unrest and the protest, uh, we felt the need to speak into that. And uh, so we went to Psalm 75 as a little bit of a diversion. But this morning we're back into message number four of the God Has Called series. So wherever you are this morning on the Lord's Day, by yourself or with friends or family, in your lounge or your TV room or study, or uh, hopefully even maybe in a nice patch of sun somewhere with your iPad, why don't you turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the book of 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, and we're going to be into chapter 4 this morning, parachuting right down into the middle of that book. And our theme for this morning will be the call of God to sanctification as we continue this uh, series. And it just narrows the focus where we were in terms of separation, narrows down and becomes a little bit more uh, applicable and pointed for us as we consider the call to sanctification this morning. So if I just to remind you what we're going to do is I'm going to open for us in prayer and then dive immediately into the preaching of God's Word. And thereafter, uh, I will lead us in a prayer of intercession, both for the nation and the issues around us, as well as for ourselves as believers and for our local church. So let's bow together in prayer and ask for the help of the Lord by His Spirit to come and to teach us and to instruct us through His Word this morning. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we come before you humbly and dependently, wanting to hear from you. Father, we know that you have spoken. You have spoken and revealed truth in your word. We are thankful for that. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that in the pages of Scripture, we have absolutely everything we need for life and godliness. Your word is inspired by God. God breathed and is sufficient for teaching for rebuke, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. And Father, we need that this morning. So come and teach us, fill our minds with truth, rebuke us where we're wrong, correct us and show us the way that we should be going. Train us in righteousness, we pray. And uh, Father, we do pray that uh, for us as individual believers and for us as a local church, co collectively and corporately, that we might be molded a little bit more into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, even as we hear your word this morning. Father, we do pray. Help us to take the principles. Help us to look at ourselves in the mirror of Scripture, even as we might be cut open and laid bare by the sword of uh, the, the word of God. Lord, we do pray that uh, you would then bind us up, uh, show us Christ, show us grace, show us mercy, remind us of our great need of forgiveness. And then fill us anew with the power of your Spirit to keep walking well and faithfully uh, before you in a way that honors and pleases you. So come and achieve your purposes through our time spent in your word, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Folk, I think it's true to say that lockdown has restricted us in a variety of different ways. There have been various impositions and curtailments in terms of what we can do and where we can go and uh, what we can buy. And uh, we hold out hope even for this evening when the president hopefully will give us some relief from that. Uh, I was uh, chatting with one of our church members in the course of the last week who is outside of Gauteng 
And he just said to me, he's unable to even get through and to visit and to visit family because of the restrictions in terms of movement uh, interprovincially at this particular point in time. So we are restricted in terms of things that we can and cannot do in terms of our normal function and our normal lives. But in and through all of that, during this really bizarre season that we've been in, I think it's true to say that lockdown has not meant a lockdown on sin and a restriction on sin. Certainly as we look around us at the world, at the lost and the depraved and the godless society that we live in, we can see that at work. But folk, it's been my experience pastorally that professing believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have continued to struggle with sin issues even through this lockdown season. Much of my contact has obviously involved the virtual space. There's been very little that has been possible face to face, but even as we've zoomed along and uh, uh, had conversations and uh, over the phone and WhatsApp and email and so forth, as I've continued to engage with people and to counsel and to shepherd even through this weird stage, sin issues are still very evident in the lives of people and even our people here at the Randburg Baptist Church. Folk are struggling with relational issues. They're struggling with anger. They're struggling with forgiveness, both towards family and to wor towards work colleagues and ex-work colleagues. Uh, even in terms of the heart, issues of lust and pornography and adultery are at play. Financial mismanagement uh, is a problem. Illicit sexual activity and uh, unplanned pregnancies have uh, continued even through the lockdown season. Struggles with materialism and the usage of time and priorities are still a problem. Uh, seeking after that which is of uh, that which is earthly and not that which is eternal. These are very real struggles for our people, either as the sinner, one who is engaged in uh, that sin, or sometimes even as the, the victim. Sometimes the families, the parents, the children are the recipients of the after effects of sin in particular areas. These are real struggles at this particular point in time. Yes, social contact has been limited, but Satan has been very, very creative to find ways for us to have contact with temptation. We as believers, even through the season, are not bubble-wrapped and cocooned and immunized in any way from the effects of sin. The push and the pull of the world is the real issue. I think it's true to say that even as you might be watching this video this morning, that you think that you're doing very, very well as a believer. But the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, He who thinks he stands should take heed lest he falls. There is always the danger of slipping back into some particular sin. Particularly when you've been saved out of that sin. If you've come from a pattern of an, a godlessness, you've been saved out of a false religion, you've been rescued from an errant, ungodly philosophy, you've been redeemed from a besetting sin, you've been plucked out of a lifestyle that is contrary to God's Word, and now you're a believer, there is always the temptation to slip back into those patterns. Satan could deceive you in terms of those issues, for he is indeed a liar, he is a deceiver. He is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil seeks to lure. He seeks to entice. He seeks to deceive. He seeks to entrap us in various things and to pull us away from a God-honoring uh, pattern of life. Absolutely all of us face a fatal attraction to sin and idolatry, away from truth and away from purity and away from holiness and away from godliness. As we recognize those stark realities this morning, we need to see that the church at Thessalonica faced exactly the same issues. They faced the same push and pull, and that is why this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at this morning is so particularly relevant for us at this particular point in time. As we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're parachuting down. So I think it's appropriate just for a moment or two to get a, a bit of an understanding of the landscape and the setting and the context into which the Apostle Paul was writing. Paul had visited Thessalonica together with Silas and Timothy on his second missionary journey. 
And those of you in your fellowship groups who have tracked through Acts of the Apostles would have encountered that particular episode. It was a period of ministry that was high intensity for Paul. It was filled with much adrenaline and much danger. Clear and present danger was Paul's reality. Just prior to that, Paul and Silas had been imprisoned in Philippi for the sake of the gospel. After some successful ministry there, they moved down to Thessalonica and they enjoyed a good season of ministry before the Jews in the city stirred up the inhabitants against Paul and Silas and a dude by the name of Jason and they needed to flee out of the city. They went down to Berea and the Jewish uh, uh, people in Thessalonica were hot on their heels, chased them down to Berea and actually uh, uh, oppressed and caused trouble for them there as well. But during the, the period of time of ministry in Thessalonica, much gain was seen in terms of the gospel. In fact, in Acts chap chapter 17 and verse 4, we read, and some of them, that's the Thessalo uh, Thessalonian uh, inhabitants, some of them were persuaded to the truth of Christ, and they joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. There was gospel revival that happened in the city of Thessalonica. We can certainly deduce that a great majority of these new converts had come out of paganism, had come out from the system of idol worship that existed in the, uh, in the city of Thessalonica. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul says to them, I know how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. They were plucked out of idolatry. They were plucked out of he uh, um, he uh, heathenism. They were plucked out of the pagan environment in which they lived and worshipped. Paul is writing this letter about a year down the line, plus minus, give or take a few months. He's writing to these believers who by and large were godly. They were committed to Christ. They were committed to holy living uh, they had rejected the uh, pagan idolatry in the world around them. But Paul, even from a distance, writing this letter from the, church, uh, from the city of Corinth, uh, about a year later, Paul is all too aware of the danger of them slipping. He's all too aware of them lapsing back into that pattern of idolatry and sexual immorality that so dominated the society and the city in which they lived. Paul knew the danger that they might get sucked into what everyone else was doing, that they might slip back into what society demanded and what their friends and their family were doing. They might slip back into that which was habitual for them and uh, so lapse into that which is ungodly. And so one of the reasons that Paul, uh, mo that motivates Paul as he writes the letter of uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians is to address that particular issue. He wants to safeguard them from any attempts of Satan to pull them back into paganism and idolatry and the sinful lives that were associated with that particular religious system. Now Paul knows that they knew about the gospel Paul knows that they knew about the implications of the gospel. Paul writes to remind them of the very core uh, purpose of salvation. He writes to inform them of what God's will is for their lives. And folks, as we come to that passage, as these issues are unfolded, we need to see how acutely relevant this is for our own lives and for our own church and for our own ministry at this particular point in time. Because there are folk amongst us, and it may well be you watching this video this Lord's Day, who are facing a pressure to conform to the world, that Satan is tempting you to sin in a particular way. You're feeling that pull to give up on Christ and that which is holy and to slip back to a false religion or to go back to that life-dominating sin that you've just managed to break the shackles of and those habits which are not pleasing to God. And I think the way Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica is applicable to you and to us, even as we grapple with those issues today. So let's read together and see what God is challenging us with through this passage of Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll pick up at verse 1. Finally then, brothers, 
we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, regards, uh, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Just so far reads God's word this morning. Well, focus, we have that passage open in front of us. We can immediately see that it's written to believers. Paul says, finally then, brothers. So that is a term that refers to Christians, those that are in Christ. These people are genuine believers. They are not those who just say they're a Christian, who wear the label, who, who have the title, but have absolutely no action and no fruit and no lives to back that up and to prove that. These are believers, and Paul knows that. But Paul writes to them to stir up even greater action within them. And look at the language Paul uses. Paul writes in an intense way. We ask you, we urge you in the Lord Jesus. Paul is pleading with them, he's imploring them, he's exhorting them. There's a, there's a sense of earnestness here. There's an intensity uh, that they need to hear and heed what the Apostle Paul is saying because this is important stuff. What's the issue? What's the big issue in this passage? Folks, well, we look at these eight verses, this is primarily how they are to walk as Christians and how to please God. Paul exhorts them, he implores them, he warns them as he has previously to continue walking right and to continue pleasing God because God's will for them is sanctification and holiness. That's the main issue in this passage of Scripture. A Christian life that is walked well is a life that pleases God because that's what God expects from someone who has been called from darkness into light. And folk, Rabbi Baptist Church members and maybe anybody else that's listening this morning, that is what we too need to see. That's what we need to grasp and what we need to be challenged by this morning. We need to realize that God's will for us is sanctification and holiness, and we need to be exhorted towards that and warned away from that to walk in a way that is right and that, uh, in a way that pleases God. It's intriguing, though, to see that these Thessalonians were already doing well. Paul uses the phrase there, just as you are doing. They're already walking well. They're already pleasing God. It's not like there was a major sin issue within the church at Thess Thessalonica. This is not Corinth. It's not the churches at Galatia. It's not other churches where there was an absolute catastrophe in terms of morals and ethics and godlessness. That's not the case here in Thessalonica at all. Paul is writing to young Christians, immature believers, but believers who loved Christ, they'd come to faith in Christ, but who were already doing really well in terms of their progress and their growth and their demonstration of the fruit of repentance. But as I've already said, Paul knows the danger of slipping back. And so he commands them, you're already doing well, but keep going. Do so more and more is the language that he uses. Don't relax. Don't become complacent. Don't forget the need for progress and growth. You are already showing fruit of repentance, but show even more fruit. You are already demonstrating that you're obedient followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, but show even more obedience. You're already being Christ-like. Show more Christ-likeness. Let more of Jesus be formed within you. Keep going down the road that you're already on is the point that he is making. And I think we need to heed that exhortation even through God's word this morning. We would be encouraged to do the same thing. 
as we're demonstrating holiness and growth and obedience, the Word of God comes to challenge us and to exhort us, do so more and more. Keep going. Don't give up. Keep striving and growing in uh, grace and truth and holiness. The question is how? How are, are we to walk? How are we to please God? What does that look like? And uh, that leads us to consider the answers that Paul gives in, in and through this passage of Scripture this morning. And I think as we consider that issue of holy living, there are three truths that the Apostle Paul lays down in this passage that we want to consider this morning. So let's do that and uh, see what the Lord would say to us in terms of the, the idea of holy living. Truth number one is this, that the gospel contains commands for holy living. That the gospel contains commands for holy living. The gospel is the good news message. It's the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is God's plan and offer in terms of how we can be freed from sin and come into a saved relationship with Him through the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel, as we know, is this wonderful, complex, beautiful, and yet simple message about a holy God and about sinful man and about who the Lord Jesus Christ is, who He was and what He came to do through His teaching, through His work on the cross, through His resurrection. The gospel also challenges us to embrace or to receive the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and submit to Him as Lord and therefore be saved. We know from Scripture that the gospel is not just an invitation, and it also contains various challenges. The, the gospel challenges us to repent. It challenges us to believe, to be born again, to take up our cross, to deny ourselves, to uh, follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus is to be received as Savior, but He's also be, to be submitted to as Lord. And therefore, the true Christian who has been changed and transformed by the gospel willingly and joyfully submits to Christ's Lordship. Jesus, I'll follow you. I'll obey you. I'll submit to you. I'll align my will with yours because that's what it means to be a genuine Christian. Not someone who's just looking for the, the benefits, but the willingness to submit to Christ as Lord. These Thessalonian believers seem to have got that. That's, not, that's no difficulty for them. The penny has dropped for them. When the Apostle Paul came to the city about a year beforehand and he preached the gospel and he taught the gospel and he evangelized and he discipled, those truths and those responses would have been clearly outlined through Paul's ministry. And so these believers have come to faith in Christ knowing that they needed to repent of sin, knowing that they needed to abandon idolatry, knowing that they needed to break from the pattern of sexual uh, immorality around them. And they did. They broke from that. They had responded to that message, embracing Christ as Savior, but under His Lordship, rejecting the society around them and separating their, themselves from everything that was ungodly. These believers, praise God, had heeded that call for change. These believers were walking worthy of the calling that they had in Christ. That's what Paul says here in these verses. That instruction had already been given when he was there previously. We can see that there in verses 1 and 2. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. The point is, through the gospel ministry, they had already been told how to walk and how to please God. These believers were in no doubt as to the implications of the gospel that they had received through Christ, that they needed to be walking worthy, that they needed to be under Christ's authority. In fact, as we flick back, if you 
I want to go back to 1 Thessalonians for a moment, have a look at chapter 2 and verse 11. Paul actually says that. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 11, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. They got it. They were doing that. They were walking lives of purity and holiness. As they came to faith in Christ and received Christ, they knew that they needed to live differently in light of the gospel. And these believers were doing that really, really well. There was a change in their lives and a change in their attitudes and a change in their speech and a change in their outlook and a change in how they related to the society around them. And that's why Paul says what he says right up front in, in chapter 1. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. These Thessalonian believers had been gripped and grabbed and changed and transformed by the gospel. Their lives had been turned around in response to the implications of the gospel. They were living well in the response to what Paul had already told them. Now, I think it's important, and I think we need to be crystal clear at this particular point in time, that no one, not even these Thessalonian believers, had ever been saved by good works, had ever been saved by living well had ever been saved by striving to live a good life. Because we know that salvation is always by faith alone, by grace alone, and to the glory of God alone. Even through this letter, I'm not going to do it, but if you were to track through at high speed, just see how many times the Apostle Paul commends these believers for their faith. They've been saved by faith alone. They're now living by faith alone alone. They never got saved by good works, and they're not staying saved by good works. They weren't saved by any good deeds. They weren't saved by trying to please God and by doing anything that would merit favor with God. That's true. But the Apostle Paul knows the implications of the gospel, that sinners are never saved by good works, but sinners are saved unto good works. Paul knows full well that the gospel offers salvation through faith alone, but also demands repentance and also demands a submission to the Lordship of Christ. Paul knows full well, as does James and as does Peter, that salvation has to be visible, that fruit is required, that growth is needed. As James said, faith without works is dead. As Paul himself would repeat in many different ways, that our sanctification proves our justification. How we're living is a, is a marker of the fact that we're truly in Christ. That's why Paul would write to the Philippians and say that you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We don't work up our salvation, but as we're truly in Christ, it's got to be evident it's got to be visible. It's got to be manifest to people around us. And so these Thessalonian Christians are challenged to make those implications of the gospel more and more visible in terms of their lives. They knew that development and growth and increasing obedience and greater holiness and conformity to Christ was part and parcel of what it meant to be saved. And that's why Paul challenges them. As you have received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are already doing, do so more and more, for you know the instructions that we gave you through the Lord Jesus. The gospel, the content of the gospel, demands that there is a change towards holy living. Paul restates that, doesn't he, down in verse 7. Have a look at verse 7. Just drop down with your eyes over the page. In verse 7, Paul says, For God has not called us for impurity, 
but in holiness. See, folks, that's what the gospel does. Our call to salvation is not just a fire insurance from hell. It's not just offering us eternal life. It's not just offering us benefit. Our call to salvation is a call to holiness. God never ever calls a sinner to salvation without expecting that holiness in terms of living would also happen. God never ever rescues a sinner from darkness and then gives him or her the space to say, hey, carry on living in darkness. God never ever pulls us out of the ungodly world around us with all of its sin, all of its depravity, all of its impurity, and then gives, gives us a special laminated license to say, hey, you can still live in that world and function in that world and live like that world. There's your immunity card. Go and do what you want. No. Our call to salvation is a call to holiness, a call to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ, a call to grow and to be transformed into His image from one degree of glory to another. Folks, that's what we need to see. The gospel, the implications of the gospel involve a call to holy living. We cannot be the same. If you've truly received Christ, faith without works is dead. It's got to be visible around us. That leads us to consider then the question, how? How? And isn't that the age-old question? People love to throw that at me. How? What do I need to do? Give me the, the nuts and bolts. What does this look like in real terms? What does sanctification actually mean in terms of my life? Well, focus Paul continues with his argument here. He nails down just one example of sanctification, one that would be acutely relevant for this church in Thessalonica in the sexually debauched heathen pagan society. So that leads us secondly this morning to consider the second truth regarding holy living, and that is this, that holy living requires self-control, that holy living requires self-control, and we can see that there in verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. God's will is defined for us very simply in that verse. God's will is our sanctification. God's will is holiness. God's will is separateness. God's will for us is to be different from that which we were previously associated with. God's will is that we're consecrated unto Him. We're a vessel for His use, separate from the world around us. That's God's will. Now, I know in church life and Bible studies and various other contexts, we have lots of conversations on the will of God. It's a big issue for people. What is God's will for my life? How do I know that I'm in the center of God's will? How do I know that I'm in the, the sweet spot? How do I know that when I'm making decisions about life and study, that I, I don't make the wrong decision and somehow step outside God's perfect will for my life? Uh, am I maybe going to marry the wrong person or pursue the wrong career or uh, apply for the wrong job or marry the wrong person? Uh, if I do so, am I going to be living a second-rate life in some way? What is God's will for my life? Well, focus, we look at this text. We've got one indication of what God's will is for us, our sanctification. God's will for us is to be holy. God's will for us is to be different, to be set apart. It's, it's, it's hard to argue with this point because it's there in black and white. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. God wants us to be different. God wants us to be holy even as He Himself is holy. And so when we drive that forward, I think that becomes really helpful for us. It's really practical in a, in a real way. Because if I'm living in a sanctified way, if I'm living in a way that reflects my position as holy in Christ, as a saint of God, as if I'm living in a way that shows growth and shows holiness and shows the fruit of repentance, 
then I know that I'm in God's will, because God's will for me is sanctification. But if I'm not living in a sanctified way, if I'm not living in a way that shows that I'm holy in Christ, if, if there's very little growth, if there's very little obedience, if there's very little fruit of repentance, then in all likelihood I'm not in God's will. Well, this is the will of God, your sanctification. And we need to grasp that very, very clearly this morning. But what Paul does next is he makes this really, really real for us. You see, folk, we hear this term sanctification or holiness or consecration or being set apart, and we, we think it's some out there concept. It's some super spiritual kind of thing, but it's not. This is real. This is practical. This affects a multitude of decisions that we face absolutely every single day. That's why Paul says we're working out our salvation or to quote Peter from 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these godly qualities, you will never fail. The point is, we need to be doing, we need to be acting on these things. It's not something that is ethereal and super spiritual. Our sanctification, our holiness is worked out in the decisions of how we speak and respond and what we choose to do many, many times every single day. There is work to be done. There is work to be done in killing off sin and seeking to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what Paul does here in this passage. Sanctification is illustrated in action. And to illustrate that, Paul chooses just one area that was affecting the Thessalonian church, the area of sexual immorality. This was a particular struggle for these first century believers as they came out from the depraved, debauched perversion around them. Paul could have chosen absolutely anything to address the issue of sanctification. He could have put his finger on anger. He could have had a look at the area of unforgiveness or selfishness, or deceit, or malice, or laziness, or theft, or ungodly speech. He could have dealt with parenting failures. He could have dealt with sin within marriages. He could have chosen any sin to illustrate the area of sanctification. But Paul, as he's writing, knows that the particular struggle for these believers in that church was the area of sexual immorality. And that's why he says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, mm, what can I use to illustrate that, that you abstain from sexual immorality? He uses that as an example of all sin, but with a very, very narrow focus. He chooses the most serious issue for them to illustrate the point. And folk, I just need to say, we need to identify the narrow focus, but there is a broader principle. The whole passage is screaming out to us holiness in every aspect of our lives, just illustrated here through the issue of sexual immorality. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Let's just poke and prod into that a little bit this morning. Sexual immorality is a broad umbrella term. It is the Greek word porneia. And that is a big umbrella that covers any sexual activity out of a marriage relationship between a natural man and a natural woman. Anything outside of that is covered by this umbrella term porneia. So porneia would cover premarital sex. It would cover what we would regard as fornication. It covers ad uh, 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 adultery. It covers prostitution. It covers incense, uh, incest, not incense, incest. It covers all that warped stuff that happens with, with the animals and dead bodies. It covers the issue of pedophilia. It covers homosexuality. It covers lesbianism. All of that is covered by this broad umbrella term of porneia. And for, folk, what we need to realize is that that was rampant within Thessalonica and many of the other cities at the time. Pagan worship and temple prostitution was commonplace, and often those were linked together. 
As an act of pagan worship, the prostitution was actually part and parcel of that worship. And he knows the threat. Paul knows the challenge. He knows the temptation to slip back into that. And so he challenges these young Christians to be sanctified, to be holy, to be different, with one key area in mind, that they abstain from any illicit sexual activity that they might be tempted in, in whatever form that comes. And Paul is very, very direct to them that you abstain from sexual immorality, that you abstain from porneia. Distance yourself from that. Wherever that's happening, you want to avoid that. You want to stay away from anything that is sexually sinful because that is God's will for you. This is God's will, your sanctification, that you run, that you abstain, that you are far from any porneia in whatever form and flavor that might take. Well, that begs the question, how? What do I do? What do I need to look out for? And both to them and I think even for us, even in terms of our own lives today. Have a look at what follows. Pick, with, pick up with me at verse, six, uh, verse 4 at least. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles do who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, for the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Look, the issue quite simply is about taking control of our own body. The body that we have, the tent that we live in, as believers is regarded as a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit indwells us, and that body is to be used in holiness and honor. You might recall, we alluding to it in recent sermons in the last couple of months, Romans chapter 6, where Paul talks about our members. Our members are the body parts that we have in our body, our eyes and our ears and our brains and our arms and legs and various things. But Paul makes the point in Romans 6 that our members are to be used as instruments for righteousness and not instruments for unrighteousness. What we do with our actual physical body, including our brains and our thought life, are to be used for righteous purposes. And Paul says exactly the same here in this passage. To be sanctified sexually means self-control, using the body and using the mind in holiness and honor. And that means, in the flow of the context through these verses, that absolutely anything outside of a marriage relationship between a man and a woman is sinful, is unholy, and is dishonorable. And folk, we need to realize that that is what the world does. That's society. Be it first century Thessalonica, be it 2021 Johannesburg, and into those contexts we need to hear the word of the God identifying what happens around us, where there is a pattern of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That's what your friends are doing. That's what your family members are doing. That's what your work colleagues are doing. That is the world around us. Unbelievers outside of Christ, without the Holy Spirit, are living according to the flesh. What their body wants, their body gets. What the eyes lust after, the eyes will get to see. What the body craves will be satisfied in some way. What the mind is enticed by and fantasizes over will be fulfilled in some way because that's what unbelievers do. They're gripped by this passion of lust and they're unable to break that cycle physically and mentally. But believers in Christ, with the Holy Spirit within them, don't show the fruit of lustful thoughts and actions, but rather the fruit of the Spirit in self-control and gentleness and purity and goodness, where the body is controlled, in Paul's words, in holiness and in honor. Self-control is a sign of sanctification as we're subduing that which is fleshly within us. Now, folk, linked with that, and I think this is important, 
See the knock-on effect as well in the first part of verse 6. Let no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Look, even as we consider holy living and self-control and sanctification, we need to realize that our sin affects others. There's always an effect on someone else, some way or somehow. In the context of a sexually moral relationship, it works, I think, both ways across genders. Men who lust after women in some way devalue them, and the same would hold true backwards. Women lusting after other men and seeking to fantasize over them and do whatever uh, would be the same. When it comes to actual sexual sin, not only is there sin between a man and a woman in whatever way, but someone somehow will be affected and transgressed and wronged. Maybe a future husband or a future wife through the premarital sex that happens. Maybe even a present wife or a present husband through adultery is affected as well. Sexual immorality in whatever form it takes affects both parties. That, that's true in the moment. Both are, are sinning against each other and against God. But that sin is also a, a hand grenade that gets thrown into other relationships. And there's shrapnel that affects other people. Husbands and wives and families and children and churches are devastated by what happens. And that's why Paul says that we need to seek that we don't transgress and wrong no one in this matter as well. There's always an after effect. In fact, those are just some reasons why sexual immorality in whatever form it takes needs to be avoided. The sanctified believer committed to holiness and purity cannot be living in a way that is not worthy of the salvation that we have in Christ. The sanctified believer who is committed to holiness and to purity cannot be living in a way that causes sin and that wrongs someone else. Self-control is crucial in terms of controlling our bodies and our minds and our members in a way that uh, uh, pulls us away from godlessness and, to, uh, and towards godliness. And that fact leads us to our final consideration. It leads us to the warning that God gives us in this passage as well. So thirdly, the third truth that we want to consider about holy living is this, and we can see it there in verse 6, that God cautions believers against unholy living. That God cautions believers against unholy living. The point is true that God knows everyone and everything. He knows everything there is to know about our lives and our thoughts and our attitudes. Uh, the thoughts and intentions of the heart are laid bare by His Word. And in verse 6, Paul says this, The Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand, and we solemnly warned you. Friends, we need to see the caution. This is a warning that is given. This is serious stuff. Paul is almost shaking them, saying, I want you to see the danger that you might be in and listen to me and don't go down that path. We love to play little games, don't we? We love to justify, we love to excuse, we love to minimize, we like to downplay these issues, we like to uh, take even passages of Scripture and twist and turn them to our own purposes and to our own agendas. But it was just a look. I never did anything. It was just a second look. It was just a chance encounter, but nothing actually came from that. Everyone is doing it at school, at varsity, at work. No one will know. My, my, my wife, my husband, my family will never find out. They're not going to be affected by what I'm doing or what I'm watching. I love him. I love her. God wants me to be happy, therefore this is acceptable. Oh, we, we, We're going to get married anyway, so why don't we just uh, start now? 
God's wired me as a man to be assertive and to be sexual, and my own wife doesn't satisfy me, therefore I have to go and look elsewhere because that's the way I'm made. All my friends are having babies, but I'm still single. I'm in my late 20s, I'm in my early 30s, I'm in my mid-30s. No prospect of a relationship or marriage. So what's wrong with going out and finding a guy and deliberately falling pregnant? I mean, fruitful and multiplying, aren't I? Fulfilling God's Word in that way. You're going to get married, but we want to make sure that we're sexually compatible before we sign on the dotted line and enter into that covenant relationship. We've got to try it out first, right? You see, folks, what we do is we play those little games and justify and seek to accommodate our own sin. And Paul writes to this church, and he warns them. He warns them solemnly. This is serious stuff. You don't want to be playing games with these issues. The Lord is an avenger in all these things. And as the warning came to the church at Thessalonica, so it comes to us. There's a warning embedded in this passage given to both Christians and I think to non Christians as well, because these issues affect our lives today. Believer, and I just speak to you, Christian young person, our students, our teens, those that are in dating relationships, maybe even headed towards marriage. Know this. If you're a believer and you're truly in Christ, praise God, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your salvation is guaranteed. Your eternity is secure. That's true. But if you're struggling with any sin issue, be it sexually or otherwise, understand that what we sow, we will also reap. There are consequences that come. Consequences that might not affect our eternal destiny, praise God for that assurance, but there are consequences that come. There is pain, there is suffering, there is a broken reputation, there are broken relationships, there may well be health issues, loss in some way. Our own sinful choices, in whatever way they come, leads to the action of God where we face the painful consequences of that which we've chosen to do. And we know from God's Word, as we go to Hebrews chapter 12, that God is committed to our holiness. He chastises us. He disciplines us as sons, as those that are legitimate children. And sometimes the Lord brings pain and brings suffering and brings events into our lives to wake us up and even through the pain that we are disciplined to deal with those issues. He wants the peaceable fruit of righteousness formed within us. I think that's Paul's point. The Lord is an avenger. You're not going to get away with these issues. If you're a genuine believer, the Lord is going to try and stop you in your tracks in terms of what you're doing in a particular area, sexually or wherever else, that pattern of sin that you refuse to deal with. But there's a sobering spin-off from this as well. And that goes to the person who thinks they're saved. This speaks to the person who thinks they're okay. This goes to the person who thinks that they're a Christian. But when you look at the life, when you look at the thinking, when you look at the speaking, when you look at the choices, when you look at the trajectory of the way life goes and the pattern of what's been done, there is very little evidence of growth. There is very little fruit of repentance. And the Apostle Paul says, the Lord is an avenger in all these things. You need to see the weightiness and the seriousness of the way you're living before God. Why? Because if we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we read this. Or do you not know, writes Paul, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. My friend, listening to this, or watching this video at least, 
watching this video this morning, are you 100% sure that you are truly in Christ, truly guaranteed eternal life, and truly guaranteed entrance into heaven? Because if there is a pattern of sin in your life that you cherish and that you love and that you enjoy and that you defend and that you justify and that you have made your normal, I would venture to say on the authority of God's Word that is a massive red flag that is a shining red light with sirens going off where God is saying to you, watch out. Are you truly in Christ? Because the pattern of your life and your living strongly suggests otherwise. My friend, if that is you this morning, won't you heed the gracious, loving warning of God to repent and to turn to Christ and to be saved and to put yourself under His authority. God is an avenger in all these things. And linked with that, we need to see, folk, that to disregard this is to disregard God and not man. This is not legalism. The Apostle Paul is not coming with some man-made rules. I'm not coming with some manufactured thing in terms of some constructed spirituality and how to be a good person. What we're seeing here is not some thumb-sucked standards and rules, thou shalt not, because somebody sat down and designed some no new pre pro uh, prohibitions and some new standards. Why do I say that? Look at verse 8. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives His Holy Spirit to you. But this kind of life, in holiness and consecration and sanctification, is done as unto the Lord, never ever to please people. Living right and walking in a way that is right pleases God, because it's done out of a joyful obedience to Him, never ever to some other person. And linked with that, we need to see that the Spirit of God is within believers. That's why Paul makes reference here to the Spirit. To sin means that the Holy Spirit is grieved. He makes that point in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of a redemption. And every time we sin in terms of whatever, a thought, a deed, an action, a decision, the Spirit of God within us is, is grieved. He is pained by that, that issue. Therefore, we need to recognize that. The Spirit is there as the sanctifier to grow us, to be more and more like Christ. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord as we look on Christ, are being conformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And this is through the Lord who is the Spirit. The Spirit of God is there to shape us and to convict us and to transform us in these areas. So we need to realize that even this morning in terms of the weight of this instruction. Focus, we look back to where we started off this morning. Lockdown has meant restrictions, but it has not meant a restriction on sin. Social contact with each other may well be limited. But as I said, Satan has found really creative ways to, for us to have contact with temptation. We're not bubble wrapped. We're not immune from that at all. There is no vaccine that we can have that protects us from the effects of temptation and sin. The push and the pull of the world around us is still very, very real. But into that context, won't we see this morning, won't you see, won't we see as a church, that God's call to His people has always involved a call to holiness, a call to be different, a call to be sanctified. It's always been that way. It was God's call to Old Testament Israel, where He said to them in the law, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord God has chosen you to be a people for His own treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Therefore you shall be careful to do all the commandments and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. 
I've called you to be holy, now go and live in a holy way. And we certainly see that in the New Testament as well, and even repeated here in our passage this morning. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be a new covenant believer. We come to Christ for salvation. We put ourselves under His authority, and we then live that out in real practical ways every single day. Look, I know that the particular focus in this text, as we've seen, is the issue of sexual sin, either physically or mentally, in terms of what happens in our minds. But I think the principle goes far, far, far beyond that. The overarching sense in this, the, the verses that we've considered this morning is about holy living in whatever space that might be. Our thinking, our attitudes, our choices, our relationships, our speaking, how we interact with people. I think this passage challenges us as we live life at school and at work and as we play sport and as we interact with family at family events and we interact with people at various social scenes, as we go on dates in our TV room, what we have a look at on our computer. This affects us when we're tweeting this affects us when we're posting things on Facebook. This affects us even as we're interacting with fellow Christians. Every area of our lives needs to be captivated by, by this idea that we're called to be sanctified, that we're called to be holy. And therefore, the questions are asked of us even this morning is this. Is what I choose to do and say right here, right now, in this particular situation, a sign of purity and of holiness because that's what God has called me to. How am I going to make the decision in light of that? Am I walking and I, am I pleasing God more and more through the, how I live life? And folk, as we grapple with those questions and come to various answers, it begs the question, what needs to change? What needs to change? Oh, how we desperately need Christ. I do, you do, we all do. Because when we realize our shortcomings and our failures in these areas, as we see the areas where we might be falling in terms of temptation and sin and not being as holy as we should be, oh, we need to be seeking the Lord's rich grace and His mercy, reaching out to Him for forgiveness been driven back to the cross where the Lord Jesus Christ died to set us free from the power and the penalty of sin and then to embrace the power of the Spirit of God to lead us and to energize us and to empower us to walk in a way that is worthy, to walk in a way that is right, to walk in a way that pleases God and to truly reflect the calling that we have in Christ. Why? Because God has not called us for impurity but in holiness. May the Lord impress those truths on our hearts and our minds so that our thinking and our actions and what we do in our bodies will be affected by that in very, very real and clear ways. Look, let's pray together. But as I said, I'm not just going to close in prayer. This is a time when typically in our worship service we would have been led in intercessory prayer. And I want to have the privilege to be able to lead us in prayer this morning. So let's come before the Lord's throne of grace as we pick up on some of these themes and pray for ourselves, pray for our church, pray for our country at this particular point in time. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come before you mindful of just what we've seen even through the reflections on your word and ask the question along with Moses, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. There is indeed none like the Lord, because there is none like you. There is no rock like our God. You alone are the one who is holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of your glory. Holy, holy, holy are you, because uh, you are the God who was and who is and who is to come. Indeed, Lord, who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. 
And so, Father, we do come this morning through Christ and through Him alone, and we want to exalt the Lord our God, worship at Your footstool, because You are holy. And we realize that even as we consider that beauty and that glory this morning, that there are implications for us. There were certainly implications for Old Testament Israel. As the command came, you shall be holy for the Lord your God is holy. We know even as the Apostle Paul writes, that even as you chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, it was a choice for a purpose that we should be holy and blameless before you. In love, you predestined us for that particular purpose. Lord, we know that as part of our salvation, as we live that out before you, that through the mercies of God, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That is our spiritual act of worship that what we do with our bodies, what we do with our members, what we do with our minds is supposed to be done in a way that is separate and different from the world around us. Oh Lord, in light of that this morning, we come broken and humbled to confess the many times where we have sinned against you in terms of attitude and in terms of action and speech. We look at what is done at home, we look at our interactions with our spouses, with our children, with colleagues at work, at school, with friends, or even, even amongst ourselves, even as church members at our church, and how often, Lord, we're not presenting our bodies in, in a way that is holy and acceptable to you. We're, we're doing that which is errant and away from your word. And so, Lord, with that in mind this morning, we want to affirm again that old Baptist confessional prayer. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and the desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders, Spare us, O God, as we confess our faults. Restore those that are penitent according to your promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake that we may start living godly, righteous, and sober lives to the glory of your holy name. O Lord, empower us through the ministry of your Spirit for that purpose, we pray. Father God, we come before you this morning and we pray for ourselves as the Rainbow Baptist Church. We pray for ourselves as individual believers that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and we cling on to the promise that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Oh Lord, how much we need that. Come and cleanse us. Come and forgive us. Help us to make right with you, we pray. Lord, in the words of the psalmist, teach me your way, O oh Lord that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Pull us back to yourself. Teach us where we're wrong. Show us where to correct. And unite our hearts at a true, internal, passionate level to indeed be fearing you and following you. Father, even as we consider that within our own lives, we want to look broader. We pray for our country at this time as well. Lord, we can see so much around that is unholy, laws that are made, decisions that are taken, the lawlessness and the corruption that we pray for and against so often. Father, we do pray that you would be gracious through your own sovereign power to restrain the excesses of where things are going just totally haywire and off the, the rails. Father, we do pray that you would indeed as a nation and for those in authority guide us in ways that are shaped by the law of God Bring about a degree of godliness, we pray, even as we do function in a secular state. Father, we long to see the gospel bringing true transformation. And so, Father, we do pray that truth would be proclaimed even this Lord's day across our nation. Lord, we do pray that pulpits would resound with the life-transforming truth of the gospel, that videos and audio clips would be put out that put Christ on display, that people would be challenged in terms of their sin and uh, brought back to true repentance. 
Father, we pray for heart change that is truly Holy Spirit wrought where you come and take hearts of stone and replace them with hearts of flesh. Lord, we do pray for a revival in our city, in the Randburg community, across Gauteng, across our country, that is not manufactured, but that is truly brought about by the power of the Spirit of God, where sin is seen and repented of, and lives are turned around to live in a godly way. Lord, we long for that, know that that is possible. Pour out your Spirit upon our country, we pray. But Lord, with that in mind, Lord, we do pray individually and as a church and nationally, bring us to the point where along with the psalmist we can say, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless His holy name forever and ever. Bring us to that point where we are truly living holy and blameless and consecrated lives under Your authority, we pray. We ask this all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.